Good morning to everybody. Uh, welcome. I'm, of course, Julie Rowan, the president of the League of Women Voters of Concord Carlisle. Uh, this is our first First Friday program of this season and our first First Friday on Zoom. Uh, and as you just heard, this program is being recorded and will be available online in a few days. Um, we'll have the link on our MMN next week. Um, the First Friday series is organized by the League's Concord Town Government Committee, which is chaired this year by Diane Proctor, and presents programs throughout the year on topics of interest regarding local government. And our next First Friday program, I believe, Diane, is November 5th. Is that correct? Okay, thank you. Um, the League of Women Voters, of course, is a nonpartisan organization. We do not support or oppose candidates or parties. Uh, our guest this morning is Superintendent Laurie Hunter, and she will be bringing us up to date on the process of opening schools in town this fall. I'm sure this is going to be a fascinating program. And now I'm going to turn over the proceedings to our moderator, Diane Proctor. Diane? Thank you, Julie. That's terrific. And I was on mute, so you didn't hear me. Nobody could hear me say that our next program, First Friday, will actually not be on that first Friday. It will be on the second Friday. Um, and we're going to have a constitutional specialist speak to us about the, the process of, of, of the election and, you know, and how that gets moderated. We are extraordinarily lucky, uh, indeed fortunate, to have Laurie Hunter with us this morning. Uh, we have watched one superintendent um, after another struggle across the state and really across the country trying to decide how to make these school openings work, um, fraught with complexities with their teachers, with her own staff, I mean, all sorts of things, but not Laurie. Uh, she has managed all this with aplomb and grace, and we are extraordinarily fortunate both to have her here with us this morning and to have her as our superintendent of schools. Um, Laurie's going to speak to us about the opening, uh, I mean, the kind of summer, how they got organized, then the actual opening process, and kind of what their ongoing plans are. And then after that, we'll have time for questions. You, everyone is muted right now uh, during her conversation, during her presentation section. Uh, but as soon as that's finished, we'll, um, I'll go around and there, there are few enough of, of us that we can unmute everybody and I will call on people um, in order uh, and answer their questions when they're, ready to, when, they, <clears throat> when they're ready to offer them. Okay, so Laurie, take it away and welcome. Morning, thank you. Thanks for having me. It actually felt really well-timed um, now that we're into the first days of October and have a few weeks under our belt and i um, happy to share a really, really busy, challenging, exhausting summer and uh, the fruits of that labor and the success that so far has accompanied it, which I'm grateful you gave me that window to you know, have the upswing to share as we've, we've gotten back into the schools. Um, so just to give you context, I'm not going all the way back to March. That would be a whole different slideshow of March till uh, June, but we really did start the, the planning process to reopen in May. And so that'll be the time frame that I'll start with and then it'll um, essentially walk you through a lot of the process and all the decisions and variables and facts and pieces that got us until the doors opened and then some highlights of what's happened since. So Julie, if you'll turn the slide, I'll just go through the process that um, we went through in the late spring and summer. All right, so let's try this. So there's, there we go. So this is the first thing we did in late May and June was figure out what the process was gonna be. Um, I knew it was a bigger task than I and the leadership could handle alone. And so, and I also knew we needed to be very inclusive in the process. And so we really created a structure that allowed for that. So you'll see in the center here of this graphic, we created a COVID-19 task force. That was a wide ranging group of stakeholders, about 25 people in nature, staff, parents, students, school committee, administrators, teachers. Um, and around that, we also created four, building, four working groups, and I'll go through what those groups did, and building-based task forces. So we created this um, ebb and flow of information, all with the mindset that it was such a large task ahead of us, we needed to break it up, but we also needed to be sure we all stayed on the same page. 
in accompanying that, we put out surveys at least once, if not more, to each of the groups you see on the slide. And we held uh, forums just like this with parents, staff, and kids. Um, through all of that, I stayed very connected in a way never before with other districts and my colleagues to make sure uh, we had some sense of what was going on around the at least local region, um, neighboring districts, and obviously worked with the school committee, um, both the CPS and regional school committees. So it was a big web actually, is I think probably the best way to describe it. The working groups that supported the large task force we broke out based on thematic topics. So health and safety became one, and you can see the list of focus areas they, they had. I should say we had, I chaired that one. Um, we did everything from screenings to PPE to hand washing to illness protocols to how we um, would work with at-risk staff and students, the impact it would have on schedules, classrooms, uh, dismissal, arrival, hallway travel, common space, visitors, out of school activities in large groups. Uh, we also had a whole child support group. It was really, really, really important to us that we not lose track of the student wellness in all this. As we were planning this, our kids had already been home for at least eight weeks and our growing concern was the isolation the lack of social connections with one another. So it was super important to us that we never lost track of that. So one group focused just on that and looked at both the more formal learning programs, the supports we needed um, to offer to family, which families which are ongoing assessments and screening. So we have some uh, uh, ability to identify kids in need at an individual level and some data to look at, focuses on connected um, relationships and then just trying to maintain our balance of you know our balance used to be a struggle and I probably have mentioned this in my other visits with all of you um, the high demand and performance and expectations balancing with the mental health needs we we were naming a mental health crisis before COVID um, and now needing to balance those with health and safety needs um, just seems like an ongoing juggling act which it is but one we've got a handle on at the moment um, a third group looked at blended innovative learning and really took on the curriculum piece of all this, the pedagogy, how the technology was going to play a critical role, obviously, professional development, how we were going to service kids um, with uh, different needs, special ed, ELL, uh, making sure we identified our Boston kids. And again, parental support there. Parents are working with us in a way never before. Um, and then finally, the more operational pieces, food service, transportation, which is not a small factor. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Facility, everything facility, um, both usage or, or lack thereof, I should probably say. Cleaning protocols, uh, that also evolved into some uh, significant HVAC uh, review and upgrade. And uh, we also had to figure how all that was going to mesh in with all the other pieces. Uh, because those having such different operating procedures had impact on everything. So the building-based task force is also formed at the uh, in June. So each principal ran their own. It became very clear to us early that this was not a one-size-fits-all fit, endeavor. We knew we needed to be able to differentiate among the older kids and the younger kids. Um, so we did that. The elementary schools stayed synced up, of course. And then we built this process where each group would work on its own and then feed information back and make sure that all the decisions worked together and everything stayed synced up. And I can I'll talk on the timeline of that in a few minutes. Um, that meant the building based groups went on through the entire summer and the other groups wrapped up at the end of July. So Overarching all of the work that we needed to do, the state uh, released uh, guidance to us. I'll try not to share too many opinions on some of how this has gone. The state released guidance to us at the end of June, a little too late, but that's been the theme. Um, we were directed to look at three reopening models. Uh, In-person opportunities for students and in this, mod in this definition, when the state referenced in-person um, for all kids, that's really what they meant. They wanted us to look at whether we could bring all kids back to school. 
with the safety protocols in place. Um, you'll notice that one box that's over in green um, dashes there, you know, normal wasn't one of the options we were looking at. <laughs> so returning without restrictions was clearly not on the plate. Um, but it sits there, out there for us eventually. Um, but the three we were focused on were all accommodated models. Um, the second model was the hybrid model, which in the state's definition meant we did not have all the kids at school at once. Um, some are at home while others are in school. And I'll get into what that looks like for us. And then the third is everyone's remote. And so by, by directive, we studied all three of these at each level and then um, worked through them to decide what was viable, what wasn't viable, and narrow down um, to what our plan was gonna be. So when we looked at in person across the three levels, um, it became quickly apparent we set we set a minimum distance between students and staff of six feet. The state had given us some leeway to look at let between three and six feet. As a district and community, we erred on the side of conservative, and I'm very grateful that was our decision, having now lived a COVID case. Um, the six feet then was our minimum, and we cannot distance kids at the middle and high schools uh, and maintain six feet of dif distance. Most of that's because class sizes are a little higher just in some cases and square footage of rooms is less. Um, at the elementary schools though, we were able to look at those classrooms. We're very fortunate to have classrooms of good size um, and have class sizes that are low to reasonable. And we ran the process to look at what that would look like to have all of the kids in school. I would say from early on, our, our goal of having as much time with kids in person at elementary was a huge priority. Having lived remote learning for a couple of months, we knew those were the kids struggling the most with that, just simply because of developmental pieces. Um, and so that became the process that we would look at a really clever, creative, and I'm gonna give the teachers credit for how we got here, it really came from them to look at a half day of in-person learning at the three elementary schools and then a remote afternoon. And the remote afternoon would be a combination of um, synchronous instruction, which is our fancy way of saying Zoom, um, independent work and some of the software tools that we had onboarded over the closure. Um, so we ruled out this as option at middle and high. Middle and high, as you're probably quite aware, kids are also traveling all day long, schedule structures. We did look at whether there were ways to minimize that. It's really, really hard without essentially undoing an entire school-wide program. And we decided the compromises were too big <clears throat> to even consider um, being able to do this. So this is just a snapshot of a elementary classroom set up with the 18 students in the room. One of my best stories of reopening is that we were, as adults and educators, we were fairly traumatized that we were gonna put five-year-olds in desks like that. We just don't do that anymore. They're at tables, they're at the rug, they're in small groups. Well, we forgot to ask the five-year-olds who think this is the best thing ever because they all feel like they're big kids because now they have a desk. So we have not traumatized them. They're having a great time. In fact, I had a second grader ask me why she couldn't have had a desk two years ago as a kindergartner. So we, we are being surprised sometimes in positive ways. Um, but this is fairly typical to what the classrooms look like now with the kids in them. Um, we've removed an extraordinary amount of furniture um, at the elementary schools. We've got it kind of stashed everywhere. We have uh, smaller group spaces that we really can't use. So that a lot of the furniture is in there. Um, if you drive, when we get to the high school, if you drive around the high school, which you probably did for town meeting, you'll see ridiculous amounts of pods full of furniture that we removed um, so that we could really emphasize the distancing and make the room conducive to that. So the next task was to study the hybrid model where kids are home and at school at the same time. Um, since we had a in-person half day in place already at elementary, we ruled it out. We, to have three alternatives going for the elementary kids was just way too complicated and confusing. 
So middle and high school, we did study this and this is where we landed. Um, so at both, both settings, the kids, half the kids are home and half of them are at school. We split the groups alphabetically and you can see the split by where it fell in the alphabet. We had to run that. You can't just split it at M and assume it's 50%. You had to actually look at the, the data. Um, and the structure we decided on is that group one is attending in person on Mondays and Thursdays. Group two is attending in person on Tuesdays and Fridays. Um, as a community, we did not want our kids away from us uh, more than a day or two at a time. Other communities have chosen a week on and a week off. Um, we really wanted to stay closer to our kids than that. They had reasons for theirs, which were more about um, contact tracing and some of the safety and health precautions. We felt comfortable with those while we stayed close to our kids. Wednesday became the uh, uh, day that took a little longer to discuss where we landed at the middle school is a full remote Wednesday. So all the kids are home and being working through a, a Zoom environment. At the high school, we landed on a half day Wednesday um, because it keeps our kids in front of us and it helps to balance the cohorts and the class time they have together. We scheduled um, common schedules, no matter where the kids are, they have the same schedule. And so the, the day is the same if you're at home or at school. And that's proven to be one of the best decisions that we made. Kids are actually, this makes us a little unique. Some districts are doing it a lot or not. When our kids are at home, they are actually Zooming live stream into the classroom in the schools and participating with their, their peers that are actually physically in the building. And um, that's proven to be very effective. That doesn't mean they stay on the screen the whole entire period. You know, if they go off to do independent work, the teacher usually releases them and they work independently without being Zoom. But what that's allowed for is a true sense of class and co community, um, even though they're not in the same physical place, uh, a class at least knows each other and sees each other and teachers that means our kids are having contact with their teachers every single day. And that also was important to us. Um, other districts are not necessarily doing that. The kids are getting an asynchronous independent work and not touching base with their teachers when they're not in school. And that was a must from our perspective. Um, and what this has allowed, the part I haven't mentioned yet is that we have this group of kids who are fully remote and not coming to school at all physically. And what it's done at the middle and high school is just, let, they're just part of the mix and um, staying connected with their classmates. And I'll talk about how the elementary is working in a little bit, but this I would say is one of our successes and the teachers are getting better and better at it um, with kids on Zoom up on their picture and up on their screen in the room and the kids in front of them can see them. and. Zoom's pretty, pretty capable when you actually are active boards. When a slideshow like this goes on the active board, it actually projects onto the Zoom screen. So the kids at home see it on their laptops. We've been really um, able to maximize the technology, which has been really great. But the, the gift of this common schedule and everybody staying on the same page has been a really important tool to our flexibility. So this, these are some rooms at the middle schools with about 12 kids usually is where it falls, um, spread out as you see. Um, and then at the high school, looks similar, but a little different in that, those classrooms with that furniture. Furniture, you know, individual, we realized we have more tables in certain places than desks and, you know, every single decision had a trickle down of minutia to it. So um, we did remove all the extra desks at, at each school, which is why there's so much outside in the pods. Um, this is also the arrangement now at the high school and well, actually both schools. Any of the common areas look like this now. Um, so if you've been at the high school, you know that big open learning common full of soft furniture and tables is doesn't look like that anymore. It looks like this. Um, and that's given our kids a lot of structure and I think created an environment. Our kid, I should have said it sooner, the kids have been amazing. We are absolutely so proud of what our kids are doing in the schools. It has not been nearly the um, startup we thought it would be. We thought we we're gonna have to train them and anyway, it's 
just been seamless from the minute they arrived there. Their masks are on, they're distancing. Do they need a few reminders in the more casual settings? Of course, but um, on the whole, it's been just really extraordinary. The full remote model is not our go-to model um, unless we need to close the schools again or on a very temporary basis, which we did do on a day at the middle school with the COVID case we had in a few weeks ago. Um, but we are set up for it should we need to close short or long term at the elementaries, we've got a three hour Zoom block planned with all their core classes and they'll work independently in the afternoon. That's the opposite of what they're doing now. Um, they're working independently with some Zooming in the afternoon after they leave us in the building, um, but we wanna maximize morning learning if they end up home at, a, at any point. Um, and then the middle and high school kids are just gonna do what they're already doing. They'll just all be home on their laptops. So that, that'll be seamless and prove, it was seamless the day I needed to ask them to do that. So as we opened, um, we had planned for both uh, and also um, knew we needed an option for the remote families had option to select to not come to school. Um, so we of the many surveys we put out this summer, the last one was a one to say I'm not sending my child, we're going to work remotely. Um, they had options to do that short term or long term. Uh, we're still working our way through that. We're actually surveying them now to see who really just is committed to a long term. That's their family decision versus people who just wanted to see how things were going to go. I'll give you numbers as we get to the end as to how many of them there are. Um, the Remote Learning Academy at K-5 is a little different than the others. We do have teachers, our own teachers are doing that. We have kids assigned to those staff members for their core content in the morning, um, and then they connect up in the afternoon with some of the remote work that all the other kids are doing as well. Um, so we do not have little kids zooming into their regular homerooms. That just didn't seem like a viable option. And all of this uh, is driven, all the decisions around which mode we're gonna be in are driven by the science and the data. And I'll talk about that a little bit as we get to the later slides as well. We are, we are pretty hooked on data and uh, case case counts locally, statewide, and otherwise. Um, so some of the preparation, this is the list, the short list, there's a much bigger list, but this is the short list of the health and safety measures. All kids and all staff are wearing masks at all times. The state had said we could opt the youngest kids out at KN1, we chose not to. I can't say enough about how great they're doing with mask wearing. And it's become kind of a thing. The little kids have a lot of choices in their masks. There's a lot of characters out there and princesses and all sorts of stuff going on with the little kids' masks. So they're handling it really, really well. The six foot minimum is consistent at all times. We've had to rework hallway travel. We have a lot of one-way hallways at the older grades. Um, our entire arrival and dismissal process has had to be reworked because we couldn't have any place that even parents would congregate. Um, so I'll talk about that in a few minutes and a very complicated process just of how kids are getting to and from school. Um, we've undone all the common spaces. So there's lots of structure. We've built in regular hand washing and lots and lots of sanitizing stations across the schools, especially at the older schools where it's harder to hand wash. Um, where we could, we put in cohorts of kids. Where we could, we've assigned seating. It's proven very important now that we've lived some contact tracing that we know where kids were sitting maybe four or five days ago. Um, so we all have seating charts that the teachers need to keep and maintain. We created student and parent contracts before school opened with a list of our expectations and community commitments and insisted on those being signed by everyone before they returned. Um, we have screening processes in place regarding COVID symptoms. So both staff and students are every morning create an elect, complete an electronic screener where they indicate if they have any COVID related symptoms or not. It's meant to be a place where you stop and self assess whether you should be in the schools today. We are, we are running a really, really tight ship here. Um, so I can't say enough about the cooperation we are getting. Uh, the tricky part of this is that the symptom list is a very common list of symptoms. So we have people now staying home for things they probably never would before and for a lot of just normal 
day-to-day -day colds and viruses, stomach bugs, things like that. But because it's all on the COVID symptom list, we're not letting people be in the schools like that. So this is also proven to be a really strong communication tool because if people mark yes, it's a way um, my office is following up with staff who mark yes, and the nurses are following up with families that mark yes, and it's become a way to make sure our protocols stay in place. Because if you screen, if you are present with any COVID symptoms, we are requiring a negative COVID test before returning to school. So we have an ongoing, never ending stream of people being tested, um, not allowed back in the buildings until they've uh, tested negative and then 24 hours symptom free. Um, I think those protocols have, are gonna be key to our success and the cooperation we're getting on those is also gonna be key. We also uh, work very carefully um, with our local health officials. I can't say enough about the support I am getting and the district is getting from Susan Rask, Concord's health director and the um, public health nurse, Trisha McKeon. Uh, they planned with us all summer and that proved to be so valuable and important. So we do have, like I mentioned, all the screening protocols for just symptomatic people, but we have very strict and clean protocols if we get a COVID case, which we um, tested a couple weeks ago and they, they held um, in a really, really successful way. So I, if you're interested, I don't have a lot of detail here, but we can talk about those as part of the questions and answers um, as well. Transportation, major changes here. We are only allowed um, one student per seat to maintain as much distance as possible. We surveyed parents in July and had an overwhelming response of over half of our families were willing to help with transportation. In August, we put out a formal waiver asking them to give up the seat until December. And that indeed held that we had over half um, agree to do that. Frankly, this is where some districts are getting stuck. If you don't have help with transportation, um, getting kids to school period is a huge endeavor. That allowed us to redistribute routes, including add, adding a run or two to Boston to spread those, those kids out. Um, the kids must be wearing masks at all time. They are in assigned seats. The windows are open and they're gonna stay open all, all through the winter months. The airflow there needs to be in place. We have uh, strict sanitation protocols and the drivers have been trained. Um, just a little bit of the trickle down here, arrival and dismissal because all these parents are driving have Obviously, we expected enormous traffic issues. The principals each planned with their own buildings and had enormous support from Concord Police um, and have reworked the entire process for arrival and dismissal. Both of them are essentially drive through because we really don't want parents out of their cars um, and have had to have flows that allowed that to be efficient and effective. You can imagine there's a certain so some school settings, this is pretty tricky. Alcott, for example, where there's, you know, you're nestled right in the neighborhood, Thoreau, where you're nestled right in the neighborhood, there's just not a great place for all the vehicles to go. So we, um, we've gotten more and more efficient and we're down to a really short window there where parents literally are driving through and <laughs> grabbing kids or dropping them off and the staff is present and available and systems are really fine tuned for how we make that happen. Um, some things that came up, for example, we had to reverse where the buses come into Sanborn because we knew we had more drivers than bus traffic. So just to make the buses be able to go in the, the loop closest to the road where the cars used to go, the bus, the loop wasn't wide enough for the buses and literally Concord Public Works offered to open the driveway further and was out reworking that the week before school started in total collaboration with us, saving us great cost and time. And I just, I'll go on and on with the list of support we've had. It's been unbelievable, frankly, and often initiated by others and not by us. So um, food service, this obviously had to get reworked completely. We've gone to a total cashless system, com completely online. Families need to load that up ahead. Um, distribution is, we're only serving lunch to kids at school per se at middle and high school. So we had to rework lunch spaces. Um, we are in larger spaces with kids sitting six feet apart, using outdoor opportunities as extensively as possible. We have tents at every school, at least one tent at every school. Um, we still have made lunch available at the elementary schools. Um, families can just choose to pick the bag lunch up and go, but 
we do have some kids staying. Uh, the Metco kids are staying because there was no way for travel time to allow them to get back to the city and still participate in remote learning. So the Boston kids are staying at Alcott. And Concord Recreation, one of our most important partners in all this, is running daycare. Well, they're running remote learning in the afternoons at the three elementary schools. And families then had an ability for coverage of childcare for a full day. Um, so between 50 and 70 kids are staying at each school with Concord Rec running remote learning until 3.30 with an option for a 6 p.m. if you need a late day. Um, those kids have options to get these lunches and stay. And I think, you know, this is one of the things I think we've gotten the most positive feedback about the elementary program with our kids being in every day with their teachers and then options for working families to have childcare has been a really, really important piece of the community support and making sure families were able to have some options um, to get back to work. Uh, food service, we're maintaining all the other protocols. The meals are not served on trays or anything. They're completely prepackaged and um, kids are essentially um, taking them individually. And obviously we're cleaning regularly there. In terms of common cleaning across the schools, um, everything's wiped down multiple times a day at the high traffic spots. We are cleaning nightly. Um, we purchased electrostatic sprayers, which makes this very efficient. Um, we reworked our schedule, workday schedule, so we have custodians more available during the day than we did before. At the middle and high school, we've engaged the kids to be part of the process, um, so they are wiping desks as it's actually turning into them both coming and going out of classrooms. They're wiping their own desks. Um, everything's prevalent throughout all of the buildings. At any point, you can get to a wipe or a sanitizer without even having to probably leave the room. Um, the restrooms are clean multiple times a day. That alone has been an endeavor. Both the K-8 schools have a pass system in place where the kids have to bring the pass from the classroom and hang it so that we know how many kids are in there and there are limits on capacity in the restrooms. At the high school, we tightened up even more and we've closed some bathrooms and the ones that are open actually have a supervisor sitting outside of them. Um, so in crazy silver linings, we've actually fixed any vaping problems or anything else we've had in the bathrooms as well with an extraordinary measure of actually having an adult outside the bathroom at all times. Um, HVAC systems have been completely reviewed. We brought a consultant in over the summer who went to every school and studied it. Um, probably not surprising uh, the places that needed attention per that review were the um, middle schools and a little bit here at Ripley. His recommendations at the middle schools included air purifiers, which we've now put into every classroom at Sanborn and Peabody. We also went through and made sure that the ducts worked in all of the vent, univents, and that was a room by room activity over, probably took us a, at least two weeks. Um, again, the town offered us their HVAC, um, HVAC engineer to just work with us till we were done. So we've had them on site for about a week. I mean, literally they were just stopping everything they were doing and say, they're yours, what do you need? Um, really great stuff. Uh, at the middle and middle schools were also regularly, the, the metric to measure how effective the HVAC systems are is about carbon dioxide load. So we are CO2 monitoring at least weekly in the middle schools to make sure that the airflow is adequate um, and we'll make adjustments as needed if those data points prove to show us that. The facilities themselves, um, we did open the fields this summer as the governor's order allowed for some activities outside. Um, it's a very restricted usage out there. I'll get to in a minute. We are back on the fields with our sports teams, so that's gone down even some, but we've, we did work with a number of the youth groups in town to make sure that youth activities were outside happening as they were allowed to. Our indoor space is completely closed off to anyone that um, is not either staff or student in the schools. So there are no visitors allowed in schools and that includes parents. Um, parents now have to drop materials off at shells outside the building and the um, office assistants will, depending on the age of the kids, will get it or the um, kids themselves will get it. Very particular plans with quick exits uh, out the nurse's office without parents being in the building. And all of our parent activities are happening virtually, um, including conferences, IEP meetings, big back to school nights were held just like this. 
Um, I don't see parents present in our schools until COVID is gone. High level of teaching and learning, um, which this is evolving even boy faster than I would have expected. Our teachers are just phenomenal in what they're coming up with here. So we knew we needed to create platforms and tools. So we've really, I won't go through all of these, bumped up our um, technical presence, of course. Um, platforms at all grade levels. So Google Classroom is the anchor for grades four and up. Seesaw is the anchor for K to two. So everything's embedded within those two software programs, which keeps us organized and structured. Um, and then we have a range of other tools that are content-based, inquiry-based, because kids, kids are accessing resources, um, assessments that are electronic. Um, Non-electronic things we put in place is what we call learning luggage. So we've outfitted kids with an individual student set of materials that um, they can use remotely. We are actually having them use some of these in school because we're minimizing sharing of materials. Um, that's proven to be very effective. Um, all of our normal structures came back to the, to the instructional environment. So grades are back in place as you'd expect. Um, attendance and accountability are um, equally as intact as they were pre-COVID. Um, it's pretty complicated tracking we're doing to track kids in remote, hybrid, in-person environments. And the state has mandated that we code all of that so we know where the kids were when they were learning on a given day. So kudos to our um, database gurus who have come up with all the ways we can do that effectively. We're maintaining as many of our activities culturally and traditions as we possibly can. Um, proving that Zoom is going to allow us to do a lot, which is great. Equity, cultural competency, and anti-racism are very high priorities on our list. And actually, this would be another presentation, but the um, summer months and uh, world around us have really put the urgent need for those discussions to accelerate. And in many ways, they are now being owned by kids, staff, parents, and we're listening to some really um, important but hard conversations about how to be, be better in our schools, um, identify racism, racism, and make sure we're starting to cha make changes where we need to. Special education, which um, was a different activity in the spring um, as we got used to the remote world is now absolutely a model where we're expected to meet IEP goals and service kids. And we're doing that in all of those modes I keep describing, whether they're virtual, at home, hybrid, um, we are expected to meet those goals and help kids to make the progress they need to. Um, highlights of this, we're making sure our advisory programs and home base, which is middle and high school, where kids are with adults and talking on different topics is are in place. Open Circle is our elementary program. Um, and they've done a great job of really making COVID appropriate materials. We, we knew it was important to have routine supports and we knew safety was gonna drive all of that. It was, a, it was absolutely a goal to make sure that this was joyful and not so restrictive that we didn't feel good about what was going on in the schools. I will say three weeks in, we're doing, a, we're, we're doing it. It's been really fun to see a lot of um, great things going on in schools, despite all the changes in structure. Um, and we will be doing some screenings. We're engaging kids and parents with tools to help us know who's struggling and who needs support. So it's both an aggregate and an individual level of work there. Extracurriculars and athletics, we were committed all through this as we planned that we would still provide as rich as possible a set of opportunities for kids as we could. Um, MIAA, we worked closely with MIAA in our particular league at the local level um, as the governor's orders um, indicated what was going to be a, a doable sports activity. Um, we are now involved in the first of four sports seasons that are scheduled for this year. The fall season right now has soccer, field hockey, golf, and cross country up and running. The tip of traditional ones of um, football, cheerleading, all of those are not allowed. And they are actually right now scheduled for the months of February, we'll see. I don't know if we're gonna get to a place where that level of contact is ever allowed, but that was the hope was if they got postponed, it might be. I don't know if that will happen. Um, we're modifying sports practices. There's mandates for masks and distancing. Um, 
even like a soccer game doesn't really look like a soccer game because of the restrictions, but nobody cares. <laughs> They're out playing and that's what they needed and wanted. Um, we're modified, music is highly modified. We are not allowed um, to have singing or wind instrument or any airborne instrument, brass, wind in the building. So on a given day, you might drive by the high school and see kids outside of the building 10 feet apart is the requirement in masks singing with the music choral teacher um, and you might see up on the second turf field up near Doug White that um, the band has actually been practicing out there a few times 10 feet apart on the turf field so they're getting out while they can. Theater uh, they're recreating that she's got a outdoor one act show getting planned. They're rehearsing outside at the amphitheater at the high school with a planned um, performance of very highly socially distanced people outside uh, before the weather turns. Our clubs are also up and running. Some of the clubs might meet in person in a very distanced uh, way at the school's middle or high school. Some are meeting virtually, but um, we're pretty excited that a lot of this has been able to be recreated. Um, obviously different, but not gone. Just a reminder as we, I sort of phase us into, you know, how we got to opening the buildings. Teachers returned on the 27th. Our kids did not return until the 8th. In August, the commissioner reduced the 180 day requirement for kids to 170. So that allowed our calendars with teachers to have additional 10 days worth of opportunity to be um, adult based and professionally based. So we used six of those from the 27th of August until the 8th, um, knowing we still had at least uh, between four and more. We have, we have five of our own. So we knew we still had more professional days available to us. We are putting those in monthly as the year goes on rather than using them all at the beginning like a lot of districts did. That also meant we were among the first districts to open. We're pretty sure our middle school was the first middle school to open because everybody else opened a week later. Uh, and so the ninth, we had we phased uh, K five in on the ninth, and the other the older kids were still learning virtually. And on the tenth, we started to bring in the first group of uh, middle and high school kids. And by the eleventh, we had the second group in person, and we were off and running with everybody in the schools on whatever schedule was determined. So what's really important for us, and we have we keep reminding ourselves of this, while the schools always have kids in them um, at the middle and high school and in the elementaries in the morning, there is at least as much time or more that kids are still learning at home. And we can never lose sight of that because that's such a critical piece. In many cases, those kids are with us virtually when they're learning at home, but it's just so important to never forget that um, learning is now very much a, a home-based activity as much as it is an in-school activity. Just a quick snapshot of how our enrollments fell. Some districts really lost kids. We did not. In fact, we were getting calls of kids uh, coming to us as they learned of other communities opening plans, etc. So we didn't get a big influx, but we held our own for sure. Uh, to just break this down, uh, the half-day hybrid column those are our kids who are coming in person on any of the modified schedules. So in the elementary school, those are the kids coming in the mornings. And in the middle and high school, those are the kids who are on that Monday, Thursday or Tuesday, Friday split. So you can see that's a vast majority of our kids. Um, the next column, the remote column, those are the number of families that um, opted for a 100% remote program. So those kids are not coming into the schools. Uh, this number is dropping slowly. Uh, we've had some kids migrate back to us already. Um, I'm sure there will be a core percentage of kids who do not, and we will continue to work, teach them remotely. Um, our numbers here, we had a, we had, uh, there, are, there are districts that has many as 20 and 25% remote students. Our numbers aren't nearly that. Um, and then there's the small section. This would be the cohort I haven't talked a whole lot about. Kids who are in our buildings full time in person um, at Alcott, and it does include the MECO students, but at all schools, it includes our high needs kids, whether they're um, the most intense special education students. 
So our intense special education programs are open full time as our our English language learner kids are also in our schools full time. So you can see that equates to um, 77 kids coming all day, every day, except for the Wednesday swing at the middle school. So that gives you the numbers to go with it all. Um, I mentioned the data and I just, part of my closing is how important this has become to us. Um, in the spring, it was all about the state level data and decisions were being made at the state level after we closed. It's another story to tell you how we closed. We, we all closed at the local level because the state was taking too long. And then decisions were all made at the state level up through the summer. What's really happened as the um, summers evolved, and this started with our own local officials, uh, which I'm so grateful for, working to break out the data that they oversee so we could really get a handle on what was happening in our own communities. Not that we don't need to know what's going on in other communities because we have staff and kids who are in other communities, but of course the majority of our folks are, um, are local and we just need to understand the amount of community spread. And right now the amount of community spread is very, very, very low in Concord, Carlisle um, and even our neighbors in Lincoln and Sudbury. And that's gonna be the critical piece. Um, we're seeing, as you've seen certainly on the media, um, hotspots of different kinds in different communities. Mm -hmm. the, the other piece that was very important was that the state did after much, much um, <laughs> begging and pleading by the superintendents, to please give us some thresholds for when we might start to consider closing and when we would feel more comfortable. So they, that is when they started to release um, the town maps that you're now seeing on the media and such, putting these thresholds together of the incident rates per 100,000, which is what the column you see there um, that Susan breaks out for us. And those metrics have become really um, important guide, guiding tools for us. Uh, what it doesn't mean is that there's an automatic switch that's going to get flipped just because something happens. So if we were to flip to red, which is if you get to over eight, a rate of eight per 100,000, um, that we would automatically close. So what it does mean is we need to start looking at what's going on around us and deciding if staying open is the, the best decision. Um, it also means that just because we have a COVID case, doesn't mean we would automatically close. And we've learned so much and are so well supported by the health officials that the, um, goodness knows I didn't plan to have an example already at day eight of school when we had a positive case at, at Sanborn, but it proved to be a really important process for us and one that I think has actually built confidence in the plan. Um, we were able to immediately contact Trace and determine the level of risk we had. Um, we got notified at eight o'clock at night. So this is the variable that we can't control is when information comes to us. And of course, just like you'd expect, it's probably not a week, to, you know, a 10 a.m. event at, you know, eight o'clock at night, or my guess is we'll get some over different weekends as things evolve. Um, so immediately it was clear we couldn't contact Trace at nine and 10 o'clock at night. So we went to a remote mode uh, that next day at Sanborn only, we didn't, everybody else, well at Sanborn and Peabody only, K-5 and the high school functioned as normal because we knew um, the uh, exposure levels weren't beyond that. We could already tell from information we'd gathered from the family that it was all a middle school um, discussion. And then over the course of that next day, we were able to contact trace. And I should stress the public health nurse does all the contact tracing. That is not us at the schools. We just work with her to get the information. And by the end of the day, we were quite sure it was quite contained. And that was a Friday that we had gone remote. And by Monday, we were back up and running. The kids who had been close contacts with great airing on the side of caution um, were quarantined the whole time and learned remotely. And two weeks went by very uneventfully. And we're, that was just a success story all around. And um, I think, I think people's confidence remained as high or higher. I had some concern people would panic and we'd flee from the schools with a case that early and that is not at all what happened. Uh, I'll just finish by stressing the level of 
you know, this is a community effort. This is not just the schools by any stretch of the imagination. Parents are now our partners in ways never before. Uh, the town of Concord has just been, I, I know I've said it, but the, the list is, that's probably not even the whole list. The police have put traffic details in at the schools and just covering that. The fire department helping us get PPE, modifying fire drills, as you can imagine. You can't just pull the alarm like before. DPW helping with um, different things that needed to get done, facilities with the HVAC and other things. The library partnered with us since we closed and continues to offer new opportunities to kids remotely. Um, the health officials are just beyond phenomenal. I, I hope every community has that kind of support. I know my colleagues don't and it makes me more grateful. Um, we've stayed connected with all of the private schools in town, knowing that everybody needs to know what's going on in every setting. I think that's been a really important support system as well. Emerson Hospital, they have become a hot, <laughs> they are a hotline for me. Uh, we made donations back in March, cleared out our schools of uh, supplies that we had, and it just fostered this collaboration that went from us helping them to them helping us. And now they're supporting us when testing needs to happen. Um, they've supported us when we had urgent PPE needs. Um, it's really been been really, really great and important. And I could go on and on, but those are the, the highlights of the partnership. So this has been nothing short of a community lift and one that's going really successfully. I'm in classrooms pretty much every day. And as I look at what we are accomplishing, um, it by far exceeds what I expected this early. And our teachers are now to the point where they're starting, all the routines are starting to settle in and we're starting to see creativity while they get used to it. I can't stress how much work this is for them. And so trying to balance the preparation it takes to do what they're doing will be an ongoing need for us so that um, the burnout doesn't happen. That's true of our parents too, who've been doing this since March. Um, but so far, we feel really good about what's happening. That doesn't mean it's perfect. We didn't expect perfect. We're doing things we've never done before. Um, and that I think has actually created a, making sure that was the message has created a real supportive environment. But the kids are happy, staff feels safe, um, which was a discussion all summer. You know, Diane mentioned some of the challenges in other districts. I'm not gonna say this was easy. We had a lot of anxiety going into, into the schools um, and we had a lot to talk through and a little leap of faith had to happen there. Um, and now we're up and running and just grateful. We are grateful every day for being in buildings that we took for granted before. Um, and I think that gratitude's making a big difference too. We, we, we appreciate everything. So that's the presentation. I covered a lot, not everything though. So we can talk on whatever, whatever is a question, whatever questions you'd like to ask, we can talk. All right, thank you so much. I see that Janet Rothrock has a question in the text, um, in the chat box, and Janet, I'm gonna ask you to ask that personally, okay, in just a second. Um, but before we do, I'm gonna exercise the prerogative of the chair to ask one question, Laurie. So if somebody uh, does have COVID um, and they, you need to test the group around them, do they go to Emerson Hospital to get those tests? So it, it depends. Um, what we did when this happened at Sanborn, Emerson was immediately available and ready to see them. But I guess in what is typically COVID complications, and I'm gonna not politicize, but there is not a lot of oversight going on. So we got into some insurance pieces. So if Emerson could take the insurance, then we could streamline over there. Um, one insurance group, which is predominantly used by our one local pediatric group. So we had a number of kids who had to go to their own uh, insurance sites, but that, we, that managed to get expedited. So we are sending kids to Emerson when possible for testing. The other things we've had to learn, you know, some testing, if it goes to some of the big labs, it can take seven days to get it back. If it's going to some of the local labs, it's 24 to 48 hours. So at least now we know much through Emerson, now we know where to send people so that it's a quicker turnaround. Um, whole, we're staying very close to the testing options that are available. We've had several conversations with the school committee about 
testing options. I'm talking regularly with um, biotech companies that are trying to make this available to the schools. Again, I won't politicize about why am I having these conversations, but anyway, um, cost is a big factor. Big factor. Not, cost is not cheap enough yet that the schools could cover that. So we're still in the midst of the discussion because we feel like that's probably one of the missing pieces still is regular testing of kids. What we are, at least when we have symptomatic people, they are getting tested because we're insisting on it. And now we're hoping there might be a way to do broader based at some point. Thank you. I mean, this has been so um, comprehensive and helpful. So let's get to some questions. Janet, you want to start us off, please? Uh, yeah, actually, I had a, a couple of questions because I, I just thought of another one. Um, <laughs> okay. I thought of two more. Um, uh, okay. So the three questions have to do with um, wastewater surveillance, PCR versus um, the faster tests. Yep. And then the one I put up on the screen there, um, countries that have done retrospective test uh, contact tracing um, have done better at finding all of the cases. For instance, if you had a, a choral event or a party or something and a bunch of people got infected and you found one of them and then you looked forward, you would know who that person infected, but you wouldn't realize where that person became infected. And if you went back, you might find like three or four other cases and then you would find the whole network, which would be useful. So that's one question. The other is, or another one is, if you do, when you get the test, if you get the cheap uh, tests that are not as accurate, then, and you test repeatedly, um, you're able to pick up uh, more of the cases in the community. The PCR test has such a great lag time. It's extremely, um, accurate, but it's very, um, very long time uh, till you get the results. And it's also um, expensive. The cheap tests are obviously cheap and fast. Um, and the third thing is uh, wastewater surveillance. I actually heard about that in a meeting in January when we could actually talk to people in the meeting. It was great. They were talking about doing it in Venice. I know uh, Rochester in Institute of Technology has employed this and some other schools do. So Rochester actually checks the, um, the out sewage outflow in every dorm and they can figure out where a, a place is infected and then they just go test the, the kids in there, I guess. And they, they've been, they have incredible, you should look at their dashboard. Um, I, I have a nephew there, so my sister keeps mm -hmm. feeding me the information, but they have like no, virtually no um, additional cases since school started or the numbers have stayed the same. It's like, out of thousands, tens of thousands of kids, they have like eight in quarantine or something. So, three questions. So, yeah, Laura, so, yeah go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I can comment briefly on each of those. Um, Thank you. The wastewater piece is beyond our capacity right now. There's no a vehicle for, a, there's no, nothing, no option for us. And I don't know if there locally would be. I haven't heard and my ears are open all the time for any new opportunities here. I, haven't heard any discussion of that locally. I did see all that um, out in the press and in the articles. So we're going to listen for it for sure. In terms of testing, um, the, the companies that I've been speaking to right now only have PCR tests available and they're working um, with a certain institute in Cambridge that turns them around in 24 to 48 hours, but they are $50 a test. So that's prohibitive. Um, yeah. The antigen tests, and I, they actually... I just got an email with her this morning. They're actually thinking those might be available even within a few weeks. And then the question is, you're right, Janet, do you do the less reliable test, which is better than not do testing and then figure out how to follow up if, you, if a test comes in positive. So that'll be on the discussion. I know that will be on the discussion block. Um, and then the third, which, what was your first point? Wait, Maybe, sure, you, I if you have a, uh, if you find a case, oh, yeah. do you then try to figure out where that person got it and who else might have been infected rather yeah. than just looking at who else, who that yes. one individual infected going forward? Yes, absolutely. Um, and indeed the public health nurse had that conversation with the family um, of this student who was infected and I can't share because of privacy rights, but we had a pretty good sense of where he got infected outside of Concord. Um, so that proved to be a really important piece. 
because getting it somewhere else, one, confirms there's not community spread here, but two, also helps you know that you can likely isolate the case. So you're right, well, I, super important. I can ask Alan Cathcart the uh, sewage question. Sure. Yeah, that'd be a great, it'd be a great question to ask him. Laura, we have a couple of questions in the chat that I will, one I will ask for you and then the other two I'm going to turn to the people who asked them. Yeah. Um, so Peggy Orgelin asks, what is, what effect has this had on the budget? I had these, I heard these wonderful comments where you said somebody went out, an assistant went out to pick up something. Um, it seems to me you must, <laughs> this must be costing something. Yeah, um, so the budget became a whole nother layer of work. Uh, what we did in the months of six weeks, June and into the first two weeks of July, we rebuilt the budgets completely from start to finish. And you've heard me all talk zero based and all that. We did that in six weeks time, tossed the budgets that were on the table going, you know, four weeks short of town meeting, <laughs> tossed those, started over um, and factored in the new environment, trying to have a crystal ball, frankly, as best we could. Um, those budgets have held what did become important and I think will continue to be important. We did get some federal uh, sub well state subsidy um, of $225 per student. So that was a pocket of money that allowed for some of these truly COVID related things that you wouldn't ever need for any other reasons. So the supervisor outside the bathrooms exam, for example, at the high school, that's a great example of that. Um, so we're constantly watching all of this. I think rebuilding the budgets this summer, when we knew we'd either be in a hybrid mode or a remote mode allowed us to at least narrow down what the costs were going to be and build based on what we knew we needed for technology, what we knew we'd need for PPE, some of those things we could start to predict. Um, the other benefit was when you close school, you save money. So we had big balances left at the end of FY20, where, which we shared very publicly and became part of the solution towards the FY21. And frankly, we work in collaboration with the FinCom and town leaders have been kind of conservative with how we spent those because we expect FY22 and 23 to be even harder. Um, right. So we're, we're all wondering if there's going to be more subsidies. Uh, the federal the federal government's talked about it a long time and not executed. We'll see. We're wondering if the state will provide additional funds. But right now we're in an okay place, I think mostly because we started over again. Um, uh, what, what it was a lot of work, but worth it. <laughs> I know you've worked hand in glove with FinCom because I've been watching yeah. discussions and that's mm -hmm. been really helpful. Edie, you have a question. Can you, um, I'll unmute you. Do, do, do. I think I will. <laughs> Nope, haven't, it hasn't worked. Just a minute. Julie, can you help us here to let Edie unmute? Okay, go. Hi, Edie. Hi. Hi, Lori. Fabulous, Hi. Um, fabulous presentation. Kudos to you and everyone. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just, 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 you mentioned about MECO and bringing them, and I was wondering about, you know, yep. that was a concern. I was thinking about how is that going to be managed, so maybe you can yep. give us some more information about that, because that must have been another, yet another piece. Okay. Right? Yeah, it is, for <laughs> sure. Um, I guess there's some parts that make it a little simpler. We are now, as of today, this week, we are now a one-to-one -one technology district, K through 12. So every student now has a device in their hands. Um, we, ha we had not done that at the elementary schools before. And in the spring, families had to kind of figure it out themselves. What we knew was that with all of the elementary kids home in the afternoon and the other kids hybrid back and forth every other day, every child needed a device. So with creative approaches and Actually, it's, good. It, it, it's a good long-term decision. We had gotten behind on the replacement cycle at the elementary schools. So that's one answer to that question. The second was really um, communication with individual families, I would say. There was a lot of work with them as the summer went on. Uh, there, it's interesting, the, the number, percentage of uh, Boston families that chose to stay fully remote is higher than the rest of the population. So we're supporting a lot of them remotely, which um, makes parents really, really engaged with the learning, and that's been really positive. The kids who are traveling back and forth, we obviously had work to do on the buses um, to make sure that they were safe to be on those buses. We've been working through um, 
even food delivery was, and that's not just a Boston topic, that's a whole nother piece we worked on since we closed where we were providing food um, both in Concord and Carlisle and to the Boston families from March to, until June. And sometimes, well, that often meant a weekly drive into the city where we had a setup where families who needed it could come get it and not all of our Boston families do. Um, I don't know if you saw, we're continuing to partner with Open Table, who joined us in the effort late this summer, and now they're coming on site to the high school every Wednesday afternoon, gaining ground, is giving us a lot of produce to give out as another example of how we didn't ask for all of that. People just rose, you know, saw us and said, we'll come help. Um, so it's, it's a little bit of everything, Edie. It's big picture work, it's individual work, it's um, making sure they're staying connected. And I can't say enough about our um, staff that supports those Boston kids and how intimately close they stay with that each child and family. And that's been really critical. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to ask a question um, that is not in the chat box. And then I'm going to turn to another question on the chat box. Uh, Laurie, we have a five year old granddaughter who is uh, learning uh, by going to school right now, a kindergarten. But one of the things I've noticed in her fantasy play um, is there's a lot about death. Mm. Uh, and so, you know, at a very young age, these kids are encountering in the elementary school uh, a, a sense of the, of the power of this kind of infection mm. on a community. Uh, it, has, has this come up in your discussions with your elementary school teachers? And what are you thinking about? Yeah, so not per se, but I think it's part of the social emotional balances uh, we've been using and through open circle plus our own tools that our own counselors have been sharing. A lot of social story work with the youngest kids, which really talks them through a, a very balanced approach to what's actually happening. It's meant to take some of those fears out. It will name that it's, the, the virus can make people sick and that some people it actually names death in the social story, but it also names that a large, large, large percentage of people don't get that ill and trying to balance all of those needs. We've had social stories for face mask wearing. We've had it for remote. Why are we not in school? You know, why remote learning started to begin with and trying to arm them with enough information that there's a balance there and not just fear. Um, I actually think the more they're in school and feeling some normal structure, that's actually in and of itself balancing some things out. Very on the radar for sure. Yeah. yeah. They feel more healthy when they're all together. Yeah, right. It feels normal. Yeah. Linda Ziffrin, do we, do we ans ask, answer your question or would you, I, you, I think you have a good one. Please go. <laughs> thank you. No, I, I, you did get to uh, part of it and thank you so much. It was a really helpful presentation. Um, the access to technology. So you talked about the actual hardware, but, but how about the, you know, the concept yep. that, that has existed previous to this, which was the homework gap with uh, not having access to high speed internet. How, how, do, how yep. do we handle that? We're working with individual families when that comes up. Um, there aren't that many, so it does make it a manageable task. But uh, just as recently as three weeks ago, I worked with the high school and the technology department to purchase a Verizon hotspot that we're paying for and drove it, they drove it to the house. Um, so we're, we're making sure everyone can access there. It's imperative, right? If kids are home, 40 to 60 percent of their learning time and all of the instruction is coming that way they they have to be connected so we've made sure of it that's yeah. that is fantastic david allen you have a question we'll try to unmute you here just a minute david can't hear you okay now okay go there we go for me at least it first of all has to be said what an extraordinary story what <laughs> it is phenomenal <laughs> leadership Thanks. and cooperation and achievement across our community. I am, frankly, this is a story that needs to be known widely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. You're and welcome. It, it does need to be known widely because it was a community effort. No question. And let me just put that in context. That question comes from myself and Barbara sitting behind me who have been exiled in Maine for going on a month now because children in our household have gone back to your school yeah. and we simply couldn't 
be exposed and we yeah. will be exiled for at least another month or two. It's unclear. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, and of course, we live in extraordinary times as the news this morning has made even clear. In any event, question please. Um, I took note that, and of course, many things we could ask about and talk about, but I took note that uh, uh, kids have to report whether they have any symptoms, and you have the problem that you have all sorts of symptoms that could or could not be cross correlated with the virus. Um, we also know most pointedly that asymptomatic carriage mm -hmm. is very much a phenomenon here that um, equally there have been a number of studies showing that children actually can not only carry very high loads of the virus, but can transmit high loads of the virus. Um, I obviously don't want to pose yet another problem to have to deal with it yet. Uh, it seems that uh, until we can get our hands around the asymptomatic side of this, we probably don't know how to go. But let me notice that until we have a national strategy that allows for testing on a very regular basis, uh, mm -hmm. bearing the cost probably to the tax burden, uh, there's not going to be an answer here. But, uh, and of course, as a society, we should be testing very regularly, pretty much everybody. Uh, of course, we haven't done any of that. We don't have any idea how we might ever get there. Nonetheless, let me invite your reflection on this problem of asymptomatic and the fact that children clearly do spread the virus and themselves, in fact, they can get ill. And of course, we are here in exile because of this. Sorry. No, I mean, first I'll start by saying we all know we're all making choices to try to figure out how to manage this. You know, I'm, I haven't seen my parents in six months and uh, we know certain families made choices for their kids to stay home for those kinds of reasons. And we are supportive of every decision anybody needed to make. I didn't mention that I have 40 teachers work teaching remotely from home for their yeah. own medical reasons. Um, that That alone was a leap of faith that that actually could we've never done that kids go to school and teachers home we didn't know for sure how that was going to work it's working beautifully <laughs> um it's working beautifully but it also meant i needed more supervision in the schools and that's another layer of cost we are using the um state subsidy for so we've tried to really you know i guess my first comment is try to really work with individual needs whether it's staff or families and support whatever decision they, they made. Um, I won't get into, there's a whole nother layer of childcare issue here with our own staff and how to support needs that they have with their own kids not being in school all the time and the level of creative work that's had to go on there. Um, so all that's important. To your point, David, I'm just gonna agree with you. That's why I'm actively as an individual superintendent pursuing testing at the rate that I am and talking with these connections locally, which I feel very fortunate being in Concord. I have local connections because people have reached out and said such and such, my, my, my son works at such and such and they're building a, building a testing piece and that's gotten me into some, some layer of a network kind of thing. Um, Totally agree, David. I agree on every point of it. And my hope is that we get to a cost effective way to do that soon so that um, we have the ability to do so. The great struggle I have is that it may become a have not, have and have not issue. Mm -hmm. Those of us who can maybe will and the others might not. And that's, that's really a trouble spot for me, but it may be how we can maintain things long term. So. Thank you, Laurie. That's terrific. We have one participant stuck in the waiting room, Stefan Bader. I, I hope he can get in. We're going to try to figure out how to get him in. Um, other questions that people have. I mean, this has been, we have about another uh, nine minutes and a uh, Carlin. Carlin? Yes. Hi. Um, a question about the MNTV studio that's actually located in the high school before the shutdown occurred. Middle school students and high school students use the studio a lot for their program, programs and the special projects. Now the studio is shut down to outsiders. I understand that the staff is now back into the studio. 
So with that in mind, can the students and teachers now use the TV studio and its resources? Um, and also when MMN hires its education coordinator, do you think that'll help increase the use? Oh, well, let me start with the last question. Yes, definitely. With an educational coordinator, we will absolutely increase usage. Um, Carlin, we just haven't gotten to it yet. We, we had allowed the staff back into the high school really early on so that MM, you know, so they could stay up and running. Um, we are so in the still startup phase here that we haven't even had a chance to think through if there's a way we could access in there. I think we'd have to have a conversation with the town about whether those employees are going to hold to the same protocols and symptoms, you know, all the all of that variable that we haven't talked about yet. What they have already started doing for us is helping with some of the virtual work. So for example, like the high school back to school night, we worried the Zoom capacity would exceed what we had and they, they um, you know, simultaneously streamed the whole thing for us. So I think there's even virtual partnerships there that we can continue to explore. Um, we just haven't gotten to that yet, but it's on the radar and you're right, it could be a really opp big opportunity. Um, in a, and, and frankly, a long-term vision is to better use that incredible resource with the kids and with the, with the schools. Uh, Laurie, uh, thank you so much. What about the library? Uh, you say there's been a collaboration with the library. Can you um, it, yeah. uh, in, enlarge that discussion? Yeah, absolutely. That's so part of the way that we can help. Sure. So part of uh, a couple of things come to mind. The biggest, probably most substantial one is that as we provided educational opportunities for kids over the summer. Um, we partnered with the library to promote their reading program in a way unlike ever before um, and used it as a vehicle to say to parents, if you want your kids to you know, not have this enormous slide as the schools close, um, this is, you know, daily reading is an incredibly important way for young kids to stay, stay on track. So we had record participation. Um, we partnered with them by one, promoting it as part of our summer educational program, and two, by offering a little incentive. And they re, you know, reci reciprocated by um, really connecting and promoting it within. And um, just this week, we had over 500 kids participate, which is wow. over, tw over twice what normally happens. Um, and then just this week, Kristen Herbert, our teaching and learning director, was over at the library, had her picture taken with the top readers of the program. And the friends of the library are donating $200 to Gaining Ground on behalf of those top readers. So Gaining Ground was there too. So another great example of things just evolving. Um, more recently, um, as uh, and we promoted, they had lots of great events going on all spring when we first closed that we promoted heavily. And um, Royce, the children's librarian was like, Lori, I know the minute you email it out because the numbers shoot right up. So we, we really tried to be a communication tool. And then um, as we reopened, uh, for ex there's another great example, the special collections um, librarian emailed me and said they would love to make the and this, I'm drooling because the special collections, I've been in that room, the special <laughs> collections in Concord is quite a room um, to make that collection available to our social studies kids virtually. So that partnership's getting up and running where they'll be, have access to, the, to that collection. So it just continues to evolve. They've had us on their radar all throughout um, and all of it's virtual, but it's been really, really important. You know, this has been such an amazing conversation. I'm going to ask one last question, unless I see sure. another one. Stefan, welcome. Um, unless I unless I see another one. Um, so I'm looking around. At what I want to know is how can we help? Uh, is there anything? That, is there is there yeah. an need that you have um, that that you wish we could mobilize citizens to be part of and and mobilize our large network to help? I don't think there's a burning need at the moment. I think just bringing you in the conversation gives you an awareness of what's happening and I would expect there'll be a time and place knowing how connected all of you are where you're like oh I wonder if the schools could benefit from this and that's how so much has evolved just because people get closer to it and they're like oh I wonder if this could be a useful thing and I I, I think knowing all of you you're going to come up with your own ideas to offer us those things but I will definitely let you know 
Um, you know, just a couple other partners, Concord Ed Fund has been right at our side through all of this, not on not only with what they normally do, but you know, just what what do you need in a crisis and same idea. They just got on the radar and then when opportunities came up. So they funded the first round of paid Zoom accounts for the high school in the spring, which we're still using. And wow. they're about to fund bike racks because we have record numbers of kids riding. Um, and suddenly we have bikes all over the property that are just, you know, <laughs> piling up. So um, <laughs> really just the conversations seem to be where it starts and then the needs kind of evolve. So I will certainly let you know if I have yeah, a particular. Because we're, um, you know, they, we're not always gonna be as connected uh, yeah. in our general age cohort. Um, as as some of the as, as some of your parents are, and therefore, uh, if if you need tutoring or anything that you think Thank you. that Thank we you. might be able to help with, it would be wonderful Excellent. to just let us know. And and Hayden has the last question. Whether this is the right last question, I don't know. But when you commented about different organizations funding, like the bike racks and gaining ground, still giving money for or, or produce and all, um, I'm thinking that not only are organizations like the League and uh, Concord Ed Fund and all interested, but individuals are interested. And if there was a way that if there was a special thing that one could give money for, so that could happen, um, letting if, a mechanism so people would know and, and also making it so it's easy to give money that goes to something. Because my understanding is if an individual like a PTG raising money, it sort of had to the way it could go in to get to what right. you want it to be and making that mechanism work because I think a lot of us would love to be able to help to make specific things work this year. Right. <laughs> and the money might be there, but having the whole mechanism and then letting us know about that. Um, in particular, I gave some money in the beginning when you were looking for money so mm -hmm. that food could be made available for people to come for breakfast. Is that still happening? Do you still need money for that? Sure. So that, that is how we sustained our grocery program from March right. through June. Right. We raised, we raised $40,000. Yeah. Wow. And that is the only way that program was even, uh, wasn't, uh, the schools couldn't fund that. And we shouldn't no. be using public money for that. And we didn't. Um, and that is exactly how that sustained. So your money supported a good amount of families and not just school families. It was available to all all met all citizens is, is that still happening or or was that only so that yeah that we faded that out in june or no sorry we faded that out in august we ran it all summer um and now it's being replaced partly because the school's open so we can't right. continue it right. and my food service director is actually you know helping us get lunches out not just running groceries um but that's why that's why open tables bringing the uh, okay. mobile pantry over on wednesdays so there's still a local piece. I think, you know, and I, I've had a couple town level leadership conversations about that. We do have people needing food in Concord yes. and Carlisle. And I think we tapped that need locally in maybe a way that it wasn't quite so concrete. And I'm really excited Open Table's risen to help sustain that because mm -hmm. it needs to be locally available. Maynard's close, but it's not the same as being in town. So, um, so thanks, Anna. I'll keep that in mind because I, Good. I will definitely keep that in mind because we just, you know, I, I sound really confident, but we don't know what every day is going to bring still here. <laughs> every day, I don't know what's going to happen. So. One of my Thank favorite you. friends said the other day, um, if you want to make God laugh, have a plan. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> So, right. so we we all know <laughs> there is nothing predictable. Yeah. One of the things that is predictable, of course, Laurie, is that we have you. Oh, yeah. thanks. And, here, here. And yeah. all that your team has brought to yeah. the town, and we are deeply grateful. Thank you. In any way that we and others can be supportive, we, we stand ready to. So right. I, I want to have a quick call out to Ingrid. Um, who had this idea to have you. We were going to do it a little bit later, but um, Ingrid, I just want to say to all of us, thank you. Because uh, yeah. it was a really, exactly the right thing at exactly the right time. So, um, sure. you know, what, a, what an amazing woman you are and what a fantastic group here. Thank you all for joining us this morning. It means a lot. This will be recorded. Uh, in fact, Julie, why don't you explain how people can see this if they were not able to?
Okay, so yes, and I would also like to thank both the Town Government Committee and Diane and Ingrid for putting this together and Lori for being available and being willing to come and talk to us. This has been a really informative program. Um, the, uh, this has been recorded and will be made available through MMN's YouTube channel once we, we have to do a little editing to <clears throat> take out a couple of technical bobbles and, and uh, make sure that there's appropriate captioning on it. But um, I, when the link's available, we will be sharing that and you may certainly share that with your friends, your enemies, your neighbors, or whoever you think would like to see it. Um, and please come back and join us on November 12th, Diane. It was, it was which is Friday. Cool. The, the next Friday, so that the second Friday in November for our next First Friday program. <laughs> um, on behalf of the League of Women Voters of Concord Carlisle, thank you all for coming and have a uh, wonderful weekend. Bye. <laughs>